There we go. Okay. Thanks everybody for joining. This morning we have Dr. Jeremy Steinberger. He is Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery, Orthopedics and Rehabilitation Medicine. He's Director of the Minimally Invasive, of Minimally Invasive Spine Surgery here at Mount Sinai. As you can see in his education here, he uh, did his undergrad at Yeshiva. He did medical school at Albert Einstein and he's been with us for residency. He did fellowship at the Hospital for Special, special Surgery. And today he's gonna be uh, rehashing the age old discussion anterior versus posterior. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Thank you, Chris. And I'll share my screen. And uh, is that visible with the correct uh, display setting? No, we have the um, viewer. Got it. That should be better. Is that better? Better. Perfect, thank you. Um, so good morning, everybody. Today we'll be talking about uh, the age-old debate, anterior versus posterior versus combined approaches. Uh, for cervical pathology. This is going to be case heavy, low on pimping, and uh, min moderate on literature review. Uh, I have disclosures, none of which are in any way relevant to this talk. Some cases have relatively straightforward decision making. So this is someone who had a massive C6-7 disc herniation. We did a one level ACDF. This is someone who also had a massive disc herniation. She was young and she really was uh, anti-fusion and we presented both options and she did well with the disc replacement. And this is someone with unilateral foraminal stenosis at one level and an otherwise pristine spine and left-handed numbness. Uh, and this is C7T1. So one level cervical frame anatomy, ambulatory surgery, home in a day. Um, and I think all those are, I would say, definitely not chip shots, but very easy decision-making. But I feel that most cases don't, and most cases have a lot of subtlety uh, in decision-making, and that's what I'll focus on today. So I think there's two very common patterns we see as outpatient cervical spine patients. One very common pattern is someone who has severe central stenosis at one level and maybe another level, and then a third level that's moderate with moderate stenosis in the foramen. And the question is, do you do them all? Do you do just the most severe? Of course, you have to listen to the patient, but let's say the patient has C4, 5, and C5, 6 symptomatology. Are you going to do C6, 7 while you're there anyway? I think that's like a, one of the most common scenarios we see. Another one is a patient who has multi-level significant disease, but one obvious clear culprit, either demonstrated on EMG or just a very clear radiculopathy pattern. And the question is, do you just go after the one that's clearly symptomatic or do you take care of them all? Similar themes, but subtly different. Um, so take this one, for example, this is a 72 year old male with left upper extremity pain only uh, and myelopathy, meaning no pain in his right arm. He's a sick, uh, sick patient. He has coronary artery disease. He had a cabbage, PCI, hypertension, I believe, uh, prior heart attack, sarcoidosis. So clearly not a healthy patient. And on his MRI, you see he has multi-level stenosis, multi-level compression. And if you look at his axials, three, four, five, six, six, seven, all look pretty significantly degenerated, but it's really four or five where he has the most severe cord compression, cord indentation. There's a hint of signal change at C4, five. So I think four or five is the most significantly compressed, most clearly symptomatic. I think you can look at his right-sided foramen at five, six and say that's pretty significantly stenotic, but he had zero pain in his right arm. It was only left, left arm pain. So we had a lengthy discussion, and in the end, we only did a one-level uh, standalone ACDF. One of the reasons I did standalone in his case is, to, is uh, in case we needed to come back in and do another surgery, there'd be no plate blocking the other levels. Um, but he's now two years out with complete resolution of all uh, myelopathy and radiculopathy signs. And I think this is one that we discussed in conference and some felt I was being appropriate, some felt I was being too conservative. And I think that at least two years out, I think we did the right thing for a very sick patient. If he was healthy, I would have had a completely different plan. I would have been more aggressive. But I think there is a, there is a phenomenon, I think, of being too conservative. And I think you want to keep these cases to a minimum also. I think we often think about people being too aggressive, but I think you can also be too conservative. And I think that if you're taking the same patient back three times in a year, you probably were too conservative in that patient and you wanna keep those kind of errors to a minimum. And I have erred on the side of being too conservative. And here's an example of one of those times. And this is not you know, clear cut, but I would argue that I made a, an error in judgment, but 
Some may feel that it was a reasonable plan, but this was a 54 year old uh, male with diabetes, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, also not the healthiest patient. He had neck pain with pins and needles in both upper extremities, left more than right. He had shoulder pain, left more than right. He had balance issues, felt like his legs were giving out. He was dropping things and had urinary dribbling for years. And uh, he was weak in his left uh, proximal arm. Here's his x-ray. So you see he has some spondylosis at four, five, five, six, a little more mild at the levels above and below. Here's his CAT scan showing similar findings. It's really, obviously the MRI will tell the full story, but you know, three, four, there's like a calcified disc bulge, but four, five, five, six more collapse. And here's his MRI showing three, four uh, disc bulge, uh, C4, five, C5, six, C6, seven more mild. And then you look in the axials, this is C3, four. So he does have a central disc bulge with cord contact, um, four, five, really significant centrally and foraminal stenosis, five, six left-sided significant foraminal stenosis, which matched his symptoms. And then uh, again, this is C6, seven, with right-sided uh, foraminal stenosis that's severe, but he had no right upper extremity weakness or symptoms. So in his case, we ended up doing a two-level ACDF, C4 to C6. He left on day one, I was feeling great about myself. Uh, he had complete resolution of symptoms, no pain. ACDFs are very nice, gentle, benign operations and patients are generally happy. But three months later, he was miserable and worse than he was before his first surgery. So. Uh, after some uh, nonsense with the insurance company who refused his MRI, we did get an MRI and it shows that C3-4, the chronic disc bulge that was there really exploded uh, and he had severe cord compression at 3-4 that was arguably worse than any issue he had in the first place. Um, this is the uh, axial and you see this is, this is not the disc herniation, this is also the disc herniation. So he had pretty severe left-sided, more than right-sided cord compression. And we ended up taking him back for a standalone at C3-4 um, and he did well, but I think that I took him back about four months after the first surgery. And I think maybe being a little more aggressive up front was the right decision for him. This is his post-op MRI showing that everything looked fine after. Um, so I think what I really wanna highlight is that it's all a balance. And I think that on one side, C2 to T2 is a very aggressive surgery with morbidity. And the answer is not to just say, if everyone has a disc bulge at every level, just do C2 to T2 on everyone. That is definitely not the answer. I repeat, this is not the answer. This is Frank before he, uh, before he quit his Equinox membership. Um, so, and, and also, you know, you want to listen to the patient um, and you want to, you do want to, hone in on what is bothering them and what is their their what is taking the biggest toll on their life but at the same time you don't want to make a habit of ending a fusion construct on a highly degenerated disc factoring in that there will be adjacent segment forces adjacent segment degeneration adjacent segment breakdown and of course i think probably the, maybe the most important is to talk to the patient and involve them in the decision making and that is uh an extremely important and maybe often underrated part of the decision making is to, because then if, if they end up having an issue, it was it was well discussed in advance and they had a, a, a play in the decision making. So I wanna highlight some cases um, that highlight, highlight anterior versus posterior decision making. So the first one is a 53 year old female with complex medical history. She has a vague blood clotting issue that was found when she had hip replacements as a child in 1987. She had severe, she has severe osteoporosis, ankylosing spondylitis, cataract surgery. She had progressive left-sided weakness, arms and legs. She couldn't move her neck at all, balance issues, difficulty ambulating. She said she had poor dentition because she couldn't go to the dentist because she couldn't get her head in a position where the dentist could look into her mouth and she couldn't uh, brush her teeth. Here is her AP x-ray, and maybe I'll start just with a, a quick break for, for some questions. So let's start with, um, hold on, I don't have, uh, okay, let's start with uh, Halima. What do, you, what do you think of this x-ray? Uh, so um, starting off, um, we can see that she has um, osteoporosis, um, uh, her align, she, um, her head is um, tilted towards her shoulder. So she, like she mentioned in her um, visit to you that she probably has issues with keeping her neck straight. Um, 
and she has um, Do we have other views of x-rays? Yeah, but just on this one, I, I would agree with what you said. However, mm -hmm. uh, how do you know she has osteoporosis on this image? Um, overall, the bone quality looks um, like the bone density is not um, is not very high. Like her bones look um, less dense. I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure I could appreciate that here, but um, she does have osteoporosis. And then Halima, why mm -hmm. don't we? Why don't you just continue and to describe the lateral? Um, so on, on lateral X-ray, uh, again she has uh, diffuse uh, uh, degenerative changes throughout her spine. Um, she has uh, a two, three. Um, definitely has um, loss of her uh, normal cervical lordosis and at five six, I would say. Um, I don't think she, she has. has loss uh, of I don't think she has loss of she, lordosis at C five six. Maybe she's hyperlordotic at C five six. Up above, above, like she's basically hyperlordotic at C five six, but then like has straightening of her uh, C spine uh, on all, all levels above, and she has uh, ankylosing, like um, has a rigid uh, spine uh, above the C five six level. Yes, the, the biggest thing is that it's, changes. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, it seems like mm -hmm. she has some auto, there's no disc spaces. Mm -hmm. She's auto, it seems mm -hmm. like she's auto fused mm -hmm. uh, at numerous levels. And mm -hmm. there's definitely like a fish mouthing almost of, of mm -hmm. C56. Um, what's a very concerning image is that in her case, uh, Noah, what do you see on this x ray? Sure, so um, lateral flex x, x rays here. They're appears to be some, a lot of motion at, let's see, um, two, three, at four, five, possibly some anterior lesthesis, um, possibly unstable. I, I would say definitely unstable because this is the, okay. and it's, it's two, three, four, five, six. So it's C5, C6. Okay. Uh, and there's a listhesis of five on six inflection, pretty, pretty um, obvious there. And then it seems to reduce an extension. Uh, now, Brandon, what do you see on this coronal CT view? Brandon? Can you hear me? Um, so it, it looks like there's some uh, joint joint separation here, um, or, or widening of the widening of the joint space in the on this coronal view on the left side. Yeah. What do you see here? That, that looks like a bone, bony fusion. Yeah. So she has auto fusion with signs of like you know we know she has instability. And then you see all the air in the in the facet joint, so it's it's hy probably hypermobile there. Uh, here's the CT again: auto fusion, auto fusion, auto fusion, auto fusion, and then auto fusion from here down, but no fusion here. Here is just a very spondylotic axial view at C at C five C six, and here you see that I find these CTs to be very nice uh, reconstructions um, and of what you'll actually see, and you see it there's almost like a, it's almost like a, a, she didn't have a fracture, but almost like a, 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 I guess the equivalent of a separation of C5 on C6 posteriorly. Making things even more concerning, Matt Carr, what, what do you think about this? Uh, she has, uh, obviously, I mean, severe stenosis with uh, myelomalacia. Um, but there's a lot of posterior compression from what looks like possibly hypertrophied uh, ligamentum there. So she has circumferential uh, severe compression. Yeah, so this is um, a very scary picture in general, but it's especially scary with the knowledge that inflection and extension, she's mobile. So it, it seems like with the slightest movement of her, of her head, she could be paralyzed. So um, very dramatic compression. Um, Alejandro, what would you do for this patient? Seeing that um, 
you know, she's mobile at five, six. She has basically two large fused columns above and below. I think a C5, six ACDF and then backing it up. I mean, you have to do something posterior here and decompress it posteriorly, but backing it up. Um, can't see. Probably. You know, C C three to 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 T two, I think. So front and back, you want to do? I do, yeah. Okay, Kurt. Um, my initial gut was to say just PT, but I think um, in this case, I would I would agree. I think the patient definitely needs anterior and posterior uh, uh, fixation and decompression on both sides. So we presented this in Spine Conference, which is one of the, uh, which is a great conference that we all can learn from each other. And um, we did discuss anterior versus posterior versus combined. Um, in the end, I felt like she was very prone to fusing. This is just the axial showing the core. She was very prone to fusing. Um, and I think we had a few options. One is to get anterior column support with an ACDF, two is, ACDF with post, I mean, I think you have to go posterior. Like, like I agree with what Alejandro said. The question is, do you need anterior column support also in a very hypermobile area, which I think you can definitely make an argument for, but I think she was prone to fusing. I think all we needed to do was really get into that hypermobile facet joint, pack it with autograft and get a big uh, fusion above and below. And then of course, this other decision-making, like, do you want to correct her deformity that she's had for 30 years? I didn't feel like that was what she needed. And we discussed that together. Like, do you want to do a pedicle subtraction osteotomy of, you know, C7 or whatever, or C6 and, and correct? I, I mean, I think she lived with her head crooked for a very long time and that was not what was bothering. That's not what brought her in. So this was not a deformity correction. This was a relief of cord compression and stability of the spine. And we do have a CT file that showed that she uh, did fuse across that facet joint, which I think once you have good anchorage, I don't think it's hard to get that facet fusion. However, hindsight being 2020, I think in retrospect, even though she did well, I think I think five, six would have been a much more guaranteed outcome because this, you know you have the support anterior column also, but she did she did do well with a posterior column support only. The next case is a 65-year-old female with diabetes and hypertension. She was presenting with classic myelopathy, falls, dropping items, difficulty with dexterity, upper extremity, lower extremity weakness, bilateral urinary hesitancy. Uh, here's her CAT scan, and I'm just going to skip to the MRI because it's so telling. Um, she has pretty severe stenosis up and down her entire spine, uh, up her entire cervical spine. Um, and for her, um, you see the axials. I think this is four or five right-sided cord compression with signal change, five, six left-sided signal change, six, seven cord flattening and a, a broad-based disc bulge. Um, so let's, let's start again. Uh, let's go to Ray. Is Ray there, Ray? Oh, Ray, sorry, my internet broke off for a second. Could you repeat your question? Uh, what would you do for this patient? Um, hmm, okay, so looking at this patient, well, I, um, I, I, I see pretty severe central canal stenosis starting from the level of um, three, uh, there's a little bit of three, but four, five, six. Um, and there's a little bit of retrolithesis on six, uh, six on seven. So because it's such a large segment, I would, um, my first thought is going posteriorly and for posterior, uh, for um, fusing as a fusion construct posteriorly, I definitely want to extend it beyond the, um, beyond the edge of the, um, edge of the, uh, beyond the worst levels. So in this case, I think I would do a C3 to um, T1 decompression and um, an, uh, an instrument in the fusion. The only thing I would say about that, which is a reasonable plan, is that if you're going to do that, remember that the cord floats posteriorly, and it's very important to undercut C2 where it's stenotic there. 
because mm-hmm. uh, you can have the cord basically, and, and you'll see it actually in a second, but the cord will go like this and you don't want it to kink off at C23. Um, and, uh, and you don't feel like there's any need for an anterior, just a posterior. Um, yes, I think the po- uh, posterior decompression alone should be, should be enough. I agree. And that's what I did. Um, and, uh, but there was a lot of discussion about this case, whether posterior was enough, would the cord float back enough away from the ventral pathology? Um, we discussed doing maybe a four or five ACDF and then a posterior or just, or, or a multi-level ACDF and then a posterior. We ended up doing uh, C2 to T2 decompression fusion. Um, and uh, post-operatively, the patient developed a C5 palsy. If there was ever a patient who I could have predicted that, it was her. Um, and uh, we got her a post-op MRI, and I think we don't often see it afterwards, but I think it really shows beautifully how it's not even close to the ventral pathology when you have a patient who has, you know, you do the bivector traction and you give them good extension and you fix the kyphosis a little, as well as a nice wide decompression, you can really excuse me, you can really get a, a wide decompression with no ventral pathology remnant. You see she has a little bit of like almost cord uh, hyperintensity there, which is which she had pre-op, but you see it better. Um, so I think you can definitely accomplish a lot with a posterior approach. Um, and there's literature to support this. So uh, this is a patient with 264 cervical spondylotic myelopathy patients. Um, and there was basically equivalent efficacy of anterior versus posterior, but I would argue that it's such a vague discussion to say anterior versus posterior, because there's so many factors that go into, it's not as simple as our anterior, do anterior patients do as well as posterior? It all depends on what their pathology is in the first place, but uh, the AO study uh, presented uh, 757 patients with no difference in MJOA, NDI, SF36 at two years with anterior versus posterior for degenerative cervical spondylotic myelopathy. And then of course the K-line, which I think is a very important concept. So you go back to this film and you wonder, is posterior enough? One way to help you make that decision-making in that decision-making is is the K-line. So the principle of a K-line is more important than the measurements, but both are important to understand that the K-line on a lateral X-ray from C2 to C7, you draw a line. And if the pathology extends beyond that line, then your K-line negative. And the literature supports that there was better recovery seen with the posterior approach in K-line positive patients, meaning that if you have enough room, this is the sufficient, this is I think the best summary, sufficient shift to the cord were obtained after a decompression in the K-line negative group, meaning you can get enough of a posterior migration of the cord away from the pathology as long as the, it's not K-line positive. The ventral pathology is not so severe like in severe OPLL patients. Um, so here are the two K-lines. I would argue that K-line is essentially irrelevant in our first case because it was such an anomaly of a case. It was very, uh, it was like the fish mouthing of C5-6 made it very difficult to use this exact measurement. So I think this times where it's not relevant and it's time, this times to ignore it. And then I think this is, uh, if you look closely, the pathology in the last patient extends slightly posterior, very slightly at C4-5, which could make some say, let's do an anterior and posterior. But I think that no, no, no concept is perfect. And I think we, as, as demonstrated by that MRI, you can get a very nice decompression from posterior alone. But I think the principle of a K-line and, and keeping in mind how much ventral compression there is um, can help you in this decision. Spine surgery, mean, doesn't that have to do with then subsequent kyphosis as well though? Because we don't know. Absolutely, if- absolutely. And then you get into the modified K-line, which is MRI based. And uh, so this is actually the modified K-line. And then there are other factors as well. Um, but if you have a rigid kyphosis, that also has to be factored in. So if, if you if you do flexion extension and they don't lordose an extension, I think that that kind of undoes the equation also. So ultimately, I think spine surgery is not the hardest part. I think picking the right surgery for the right patient, uh, being not too aggressive, but not too conservative is really everything in spine surgery. And that's, I think that's what sets you apart. Uh, Which brings me to a 50-year-old nurse at Mount Sinai who has neck pain, uh, subtle myelopathic signs. I saw her a couple of weeks ago. She, her sister has spine surgery and had a major complication of spine surgery. So she is extremely averse to having spine surgery. Uh, At the same time, I did categorically recommend surgery in her case. Uh, and I, we had a very lively discussion in spine conference about this patient. Um, but this is, I think, a great one for Alex Schuper to, uh, to, uh, to take. What would you do? 
Can you hear me? Uh, this is tough because obviously C45 is the, the index level. Um, she has this bulging above and below and the element of congenital stenosis. But um, the tricky thing about this is that the ventral compression comes pretty high up behind the forebody. Um, so if the conversation that I going to have with the patient is, you know, if you'll be able to decompress enough just doing an ACDF versus partial corpectomy versus a total uh, C4 corpectomy um, to, again, enough of the ventral compression. Um, it looks like it extends pretty much almost the superior end plate of C4. So if you really want to get that ventral compression, I would, I would favor doing a C4 corpectomy. So, so tell me your concrete final plan. This is your patient. Okay. So, yeah, sorry. So, um, I would favor, again, if I want the most definitive surgery for her, assuming she's pretty healthy and can tolerate it as a medical surgery to do the C4 corpectomy. And then, um, I would favor backing her up again. She has congenital stenosis there while most of pathology is ventral and doing maybe a three or six posterior as well. How about uh, Frank J. Uke? Is he around? I'm here. What do you think, Frank? Uh, obviously has OPLL. Has a lot of anterior pathology also. You know, <clears throat> I would, I don't think that you can get a good ventral decompression just posteriorly. And um, I would favor doing a corp and then backing him up. I would, I would say OPLL, you know, this disc right here at least is mm -hmm. soft and you see it there on the CT. There's, there's like a, definitely like a bone spur on that osteophyte and there it's, but I, I, I wouldn't call this a classic OPLL case. Yeah. Um, I think because the, the, yes, yeah, I'm sure. No, no worries. The predominant uh, compression is actually a soft piece, but there is that bone spike there, which, which is relevant to the discussion. So I, I will tell you, I agree. I, I, my plan was a C4 corpectomy uh, and then a posterior backup. So I, I think, I think that's, uh, that's what I recommended. She is, uh, again, very hesitant, but I, I think she will end up needing it. Uh, here's the K-line. So again, equivocal right on the border. Um, and I think... Uh, that that like that this demonstrates the point that it's almost never clear cut. It's right on the border. You can make an argument for both. I in my hands, I would feel comfortable, more confident going into the surgery, saying we're going to alleviate that ventral compression with a corpectomy. And then I think it's worth. How much time do I have? Because I could go on. Yeah, I have another fifteen minutes, right, Chris? Yep, you have plenty of time. Perfect. So um, what can help us with the decision making? I would argue that one thing I have uh, started doing, mainly due to uh, Tanvir Chattery, Constantinos Margetis, and some of the other spine leaders at Mount Sinai, is flexion extension MRI. And I think that um, they can be very valuable in equivocal cases. So there's now one question is, are there any studies studying the impact of FlexX MRI on cervical outcomes, approaches, or decision making? The answer is no. Uh, I did a lit search last night. There were five papers talking about cervical flexion extension MRIs, none of which um, correlated with uh, any of the follow, uh, any of the outcome approach or decision making process. So I think that we have a ripe opportunity at Mount Sinai, being that we're doing a fair amount of them, to publish what we've been uh, what we've been finding on these flexion extension MRIs. This is a patient of Tanvir's um, who had very clear five, six, and C six, C six, seven issues. Uh, they were significantly compressive on axial, and there was really no question that C5, 6, C6, 7 needed to be treated in this patient. The question really was C3, 4. This is the axial view. There's no major cord compression. There is right side of foraminal stenosis. There is a disc bulge, kind of similar to the patient I, I demonstrated earlier. And the question was, should C3, 4 be included, given that if you do include C3, 4, that also means you should not leave C4, 5 floating between a C3, 4 and a C5 to 7 construct. And now you're doubling the size of your surgery. This is a patient who had a flexion extension at MRI flexion. It doesn't look that bad. And then extension, it really does look pretty significantly impinged. So in the end, I actually don't know when, I think, I think uh, the plan was to do a four level ACDF, which is what I would do. Um, but I think that this is a great demonstration of the flexion extension MRIs and what information it can tell you and how it could contribute to our understanding. And here's another case of a flexion extension MRI. And this is uh, the final case I'll present. 
And I'll just go through my decision making on what I think is a pretty complex case. He's not that complex, but the decision making is complex. The actual surgery is not. Um, he's a 45 year old male. Uh, he has numbness in both hands when he extends his neck. Uh, you see he has prior surgery. We'll, we'll skip the pimping for now. Uh, two, three, four. He has a prior six, seven ACDF. Uh, he had about a year of, uh, sorry, he had, so he had surgery 2018. He did very well. And then since then he's had falls, he's had multiple concussions. Uh, he has one year of neck pain, left shoulder pain, left arm pain, uh, sorry, his left arm goes numb intermittently and then recovers. Then it spread to his right arm six months ago. Now he can't exercise anymore. Again, he's a young, active 45 year old lawyer. Gabapentin doesn't help. Physical therapy didn't help. And now for three months, he feels like it's getting worse with extension. His right arm tightness and pain is worsening, right arm numbness, right hand weakness. He literally gets weak when he extends his neck and then, and then it resolves. He feels increasingly off balance. On exam, hyperreflexia, but no weakness. And then he was presented, I sent, I sent uh, him to a neurology and they presented him. Oh, uh, did, I, I should, I didn't, I didn't go to his imaging yet. Let me quickly show his imaging. So th this is his, um, his cervical spine MRI. And I think this is a good one to ask Trevor Hardigan what he thinks of this MRI. So looking at the MRI, I see a loss of cervical lordosis. Um, I see that at three, four, just behind the four vertebral body that looks like there's some cord signal change. Um, looks like there's some congenital stenosis. And then we see the prior fusion that you described at six, seven. Also see just above the six, seven um, fusion construct from the previous surgery that it looks like there's some, uh, a small little um, uh, disc bulge facing the fecal sac, but not quite causing any cord compression at that level. Mm. Agreed. And just as far as the loss of lordosis, I, I, you're right on the MRI, but I, I think you really need flexion extension x-rays. And if there's ever a patient in the history of planet Earth who has great extension, it's this patient uh, who's basically looking almost behind him. Um, so I think, I think that's worth noting also. But let's go back to this. So he was presented, I sent him to a neurologist and neurology was perplexed by that C4 cord signal change at a level that didn't look all that bad. And they presented, they presented him at their conference. And this is, and they wrote a note about what they found at their conference, what they discussed, at their, which I thought was very, we don't do that. I think it's a very interesting thing to, at least I don't do that. It's a very interesting thing to do. They wrote the bilateral increase signal at C4 looks like myelomalacia. No significant degenerative changes at the level does not appear inflammatory, less suggestive of ischemia. So basically they were, they were calling it myelomalacia. Um, the MRI report, it's worth noting, says there's no canal stenosis at any level. And I think this is something that we often see and we often discuss in spine conference that I, I think cervical congenital stenosis is often very underappreciated. Um, and we got this patient a flexion extension MRI and you see, I, I think a pretty clear explanation for his symptoms when he extends his neck. He has congenital stenosis, he extends his neck and when he extends, he develops symptoms. More in his, more in his uh, actually it was right now, it's left again, I, I just spoke to him. So he has bilateral symptoms on extension. And I think this flexion extension MRI is, is to me a significant contribution to the understanding of the case um, and, uh, and alters how I would approach what we would do for him if he requires surgery, which I did recommend. So I think this is very important also. So Brandon, what is the definition of stenosis? Cervical spinal stenosis. I guess I would define it as um, any kind of narrowing of the canal that causes a, a constriction on the on the spinal cord itself or or the um, exiting nerve roots. And do we have any measurements, cutoffs for stenosis in the cervical spine? Objective uh, measurements? Uh, not not that I'm aware of. Okay. Matt Carr? Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, less than 13 millimeters is considered stenotic. And this is a question for anybody, any resident who described first the definition of stenosis in the cervical spine. 
I'll give you a hint. It was 1956. And the other hint is that it was discovered at the most incredible hospital in the entire universe. So this is uh, Mount Sinai, 1956, a paper by Dr. Malice, the sagittal diameter of the bony cervical spinal canal and its significance in cervical spondylosis, describing a normal cervical AP diameter, 17 millimeters, relative stenosis, 10 to 13 millimeters, absolute stenosis greater than 10 millimeters. I think these are very important measurements to keep in mind because we see this all the time. The other thing that's important is the torg pavlov ratio. Ray, do you know what that is? No? Alejandro, you know what that is? As Sadi Gatan would say, book report next week. Um, so the Torg Pavlov ratio uh, this, um, is basically a measurement uh, of A over B. So spinal canal over vertebral body length. So basically a large A will give you a large capacious canal. Less than 0.85 is stenosis. Less than 0.8 is congenitally narrow canal with risk factor for neurologic injury. And our patient is 0.47. So pretty significantly congenitally stenotic. I think this is very relevant um, because this is a patient who has had an MRI reading no stenosis with severe symptoms, hyperreflexia, can't go to the gym, can't live his life. And if you're going by the MRI read alone, you're gonna say no surgery. I think he's gonna do phenomenally well with surgery. And I think he will have significant improvement in symptoms. And we recommended a cervical laminoplasty, um, which we'll get to. I did mention neck pain. And I, I did want to comment for two seconds on neck pain, because, you know, a lot of times you see a note, recommend laminoplasty versus posterior cervical decompression effusion. Patient has a lot of neck pain. So we're recommending effusion. I think neck pain is very, very complicated. And I think that, for example, if you have this kind of referred pain, which is pretty classic and you see it all the time, I think that's different than mechanical neck pain. So this, I think this kind of pain gets better with a foramenotomy or decompression of a nerve. Whereas mechanical neck pain doesn't, of course, this is a ludicrous uh, thing I found at an, at an orthopedic bracing website that mechanical neck pain is a result when the, one of the joints loses its normal function, which is obviously not true. And a lot of neck pain is muscular and all of us have it, including many, neurosurgeons and neurosurgery residents. Um, but I think that I, I would just say that the equation of neck pain equals fusion is very oversimplistic and definitely uh, incorrect. You have to really describe the neck pain in more detail. So ultimately in sum, this last patient, last slide, 43 year old male with myelopathy, hyperreflexia, no instability, minimal neck pain, preserved lordosis, congenital stenosis, recommended a, a, a C3 to six laminoplasty. Um, and that will be coming up in December. And I'll stop there and leave room for questions. Is, is the patient driving the need to make a decision about surgery? Is the patient driving the need, you said? Yeah, I mean, does, does he want an operation? This one, yeah, yes, he does. He's, he's, in, he's got enough pain that he really wants something done. Yes. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Why, why do you ask? Well, because the findings are mild enough that, you know, you might just try to manage it conservatively with neck exercises or, I mean, did you talk about that? Are there, are there things that you can do to provide biomechanical support so that he's not so flexible? Um, is there, is there a way to strengthen the, your neck so that he doesn't need, even need the surgery or get away without it? I should have I should have painted a better picture. His 2018 surgery was after uh, he was doing uh, yoga and and like uh, standing on his on his head. I think similar to the patient who you had a couple of years ago with the carotid rupture. I think. Yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, he's a very active guy. He's a, he's extremely well built. He's so he has beyond exhausted conservative management. His sister's an ED doctor at Mount Sinai. She, he's I would say that he's anti-surgery and that's, I think he's done aggressive non-surgery, but he's also very debilitated. Yeah. Okay. Jeremy, I had a question about the patient you presented that uh, did a corpectomy on at C4. 
don't know if you can go back to the imaging for that, that patient. Absolutely. Um, uh, just FYI, I did not do it. This is the one whose sister had a, a major complication of spine surgery, including meningitis. So, uh, so, she, so she, uh, uh, is refusing surgery. Uh, and, and, and this is one of the only times I've ever said, I really, really, really strongly recommend surgery. And, and, and I, and I, I stand by that. I, I'm, I'm worried about, I'm worried about her, uh, not having surgery. Um, that's still in presenter view, actually. Sorry. Oh, Thanks. Um, I just had a question about doing a corpectomy and then given the risk for adjacent segment issues, would you consider doing, you know, an ACDF at the level below? So you, you were talking about doing a, a four, a four corpectomy, um, but at um, five, six, it also looks like there's, you know, quite substantial uh, ventral compression as well that could, could get worse. Would you do a, ACDF there? Um, so Addition. first of all, the, the plan was not a C4 corpectomy and then a C3 to five plate. It was a C4 corpectomy and then a posterior. I think you make a really good point, which is that you could consider doing a C4 corpectomy and a C5, six ACDF. And then in the back, you don't need to do a decompression. You could just do, you could lock it in with fixation and avoid doing a laminectomy in the back, which I think is a very reasonable plan. Um, but the plan was not a, a just a corpectomy. So I, I think the plan was to go below C6 on the posterior part. Okay. Looks Would like Raj had a question. Oh. Uh, go, go ahead. Raj had a typed in a question. Oh. Great talk, great talk, Jeremy. Can you talk about the indications for four level ACDF? I thought the fusion rates uh, are very low past three levels. So uh, fusion rate for one level is around 97%, two level 90%, three level 80%. And I think we don't have good data about four level, but there's no question it's at, at minimum, there's a pseudoarthrosis rate of one in five prob and, and probably higher. Um, I will say that I almost never do a four. I think I did one four level ACDF because I don't like them. I think it's also tough on the esophagus. And I think when you get to four levels, I prefer posterior. Uh, the other thing you could do is if you do a four level ACDF, you can very, you can definitely make an argument to just back it up posteriorly with fixation to prevent the risk of pseudoarthrosis. I think that's a totally reasonable thing that people do. Um, but uh, I, I personally am not a fan of four level ACDFs. I don't, I don't love that operation. I, I think it's worth noting that even I have a few three level ACDFs that went as smooth sailing as possible, operation in two hours, minimal retraction, giving esophageal holidays um, during the surgery. And they still have dysphagia uh, three to six months out from surgery, sometimes even beyond. Not to the extent where they're not eating three meals a day, but they say their swallowing feels different. So I think even three level ACDFs can have, and there's data about it, that, that there's, I think maybe even more than 30% of patients have dysphagia in the longer term also after multi-level ACDF. Hey, Dr. Summer, I had a quick question. Um, you briefly mentioned cervical disc replacement. I was just hoping you could talk about how you counsel patients on multi-level uh, cervical disc replacements. It's, it's been more popular in Europe over the last decade, but it sounds like it's looking into literature. It's becoming more popular here in the U.S. to do three and four level cervical disc arthroplasties and just talking to patients, especially maybe a young, more amenable patient of ACDF versus disc replacement uh, in the multi-level, in people in multi-level pathology? Great question. Um, I will tell you my personal belief uh, is that I think there are some patients who are great candidates for it, and I, I don't want to be off-label um, and do something that's, that's, so right now it's approved for two levels and no more. I don't want to be pushing the envelope. There are definitely people who do it routinely. And I think it's, it's a discussion with a patient um, and you can have that discussion, but I, I don't like pushing the envelope until it's FDA approved, which is unfortunate. Cause I think, I think you're right. There's great data from Europe that three level arthroplasty is a great surgery uh, for the right patient, of course. So, and I think in general, the idea of preserving motion is critical. So I, I think that we have to catch up to Europe and, and, and get, get to the point where it's approved because there are patients who would benefit from multi-level arthroplasty through more than two level arthroplasty, but I've never done it because of the FDA. 
Hey, Jeremy. Um, I was wondering, what were the thoughts on this um, patient that you ha still have up on just doing the anterior work, on just uh, doing anterior decompression fusion? Again, totally reasonable. So if you want to do a C4 corpectomy and a C5, 6 ACDF, I think that's reasonable. I think the patient's young with good bone quality. So I think that the chance of them uh, having a pseudo is not very high. Um, I, I, I would do a posterior backup because I think corpectomy has a likelihood of pseudoarthrosis and I, want, I would want it to be a definitive surgery. But, but absolutely, if someone did that, I would not say that person's wrong at all. I, I, I would just say I would feel more confident about the longevity of the construct backing it up posterior with it with a corpectomy with an ACDF below. All right, it's 8.19. I think we can stop there. Great timing. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Peter on the line. Yeah, I am. Give me one second. 